Well, good afternoon. Um, it's exciting to see this many people come for an eight-hour presentation. Or an hour, I guess, not eight hours. So, uh, how many are here just for the extra credit from Ms. Frank's class? Uh, so, my name is Kendall Carswell. I'm a master's level social worker and a licensed clinical addictions counselor. Uh, I teach in the social work department. <clears throat> I've been at Fort Hayes State six years previously, and then I left for six years. Uh, started doing this work um, about three years ago, four years ago, and uh, well, I was at a hospital, a rural hospital, Kearney County, uh, just west of Garden City, and uh, had an opportunity to come back to Fort Hayes State University. So I still live in Garden City, and I commute back and forth to about 140 miles each way. So I'll let you uh, My name is Larissa White. I'm a senior social work student. Uh, bachelor level social work student. I'm also uh, getting a degree in organizational leadership uh, and so we are partnered together on a project that I did last last year um, and it's kind of tied over into this semester. So. All right so as the title says it's looking at civic engagement with refugees and immigrant populations in south southwest Kansas. Um, well it worked a second ago. <laughs> I guess. Try the arrow key and the keyboard, wherever the keyboard went. Yeah, I don't know. That's so bizarre because I just tried it once and that worked perfectly earlier. So. This is Garden City uh, specifically. Um, the census says this is a, uh, as of 2017, 26,500 approximately. I do know during the last census count, uh, Garden City feels they were undercounted by at, at least 4,500 uh, because there's a large section of the community where the uh, census taker marked as. Um, no, no housing, apartments, nothing. All it is is housing and apartments. And they, they went back and forth with the government, and I think they raised it 20-something uh, or 30-something people, finally. So, and, and this is the uh, kind of the breakdown. So Garden City, Hispanic populations just at 50%, uh, people who um, identify as white, non-Hispanics, 38 and a half. Asian, 5.3, black or African American, nearly 3%, and then people who identify as two or more races, 3.5. Kansas overall, you'll see the difference. Hispanic on average is 12.1%, white, uh, non Hispanic, 75, 76%. I didn't get the Asian number there, I apologize. It's uh, less than that, I believe, and then black, 6.1 and then two or more, uh, 3%. So, so you see it's a, a minority majority uh, and uh, significantly different from, from Northwest Kansas. So, and then health insurance, just a, a few things that I thought were interesting. Health insurance, so persons without health insurance in Garden City is nearly 15%, uh, where Kansas uh, averages around 10%. And then educational level, and, and I'll tie this all together here shortly, but education level, graduate high school, 70% uh, and Kansas average around 90%, bachelor's degree or higher, 16, almost 17%, and Kansas average is 32%. And then persons in poverty, you'll see that Garden City has significantly higher rate of poverty. And this all ties into 
overall health, but civic health as well. And I look at this as civic health. It's more than civic engagement. Civic health, um, good civic health promotes good uh, overall health uh, for individuals, family, and community because people are participating in uh, policy decisions and that affect them. So at any given time, this is something else interesting, at any given time in Garden City, there's 24 to 36 different languages being spoken in the high school, or in the school district. Um, I, I've had some researchers tell me they believe that number is even higher than that. But just to get a sense of Garden City, this is a real short video. Over the past few weeks, Great Big Story in Modelo has celebrated a town that for us represents the best vision for the future of America. A town that's brought together by a common spirit of hard work and a shared sense of community. That spirit recently came under attack. Three men in Kansas are facing domestic terrorism charges. Federal authorities say a member plotted to bomb an apartment complex and mosque filled with Somali immigrants. We have our national We spent a month living in Garden City while working on this series. The community welcomed us with open arms and shared their inspiring stories with us. I don't think people realize how much energy and effort it takes to hate. It's so much easier and so much less drama just to be loving and accepting. I believe providing a safe haven for people is part of being a decent human being. It's how we should treat each other. And I'm glad to see we do that here. Then it didn't make me like my home. I feel like my home. I would just want to live here peaceful, making big change. All people from Africa and people others live here. I'm, I'm opening the doors right now. And I take that responsibility because I see people need help. I would love to be there you know, for everybody. I'm not going nowhere. That's the reason all of us are here, just to, to work hard and, and help our families, not to bring all these bad things, you know. It's, it's, it's not like that. Our hearts are bigger than this. The world can learn a lot about uh, this little community because if we survive here so many years and we're still together, it's because we understand each other. It's not only us, it's everybody. Great Big Story and Modelo believe in the fighting spirit. We stand alongside those who work together and we celebrate our friends in Garden City. Regardless of what color, race, country, ethnicity that you are or where you've come from, we're all here together. Garden City's doing it. Why can't the rest of us? So that's a lot of the reason I live in Garden City. Um, I grew up uh, northeast of here in a little small town. It was about 200 when I grew up. Now it's around 100. But, but it was very homogenous, almost no diversity. So I wasn't exposed to a lot of diversity until I uh, went to college and moved out. And so I've lived in Garden City on and off. Uh, the majority of the time over the last 20 years. So how many of you knew about the, the bomb plot and had remember hearing about that? So that's about four blocks from my home. Um, so this was the complex that the, the plan was to uh, blow up and uh, it's full of Sorry. <clears throat> it's just full of children. It doesn't always hit me that hard. But these are good people. What this allowed them to do, the police did an excellent job coming in and um, partnering and to try to let them know that they're safe. Uh, the elders are very uh, distrusting often of people in authority. And um, you'll see Rasol 
This is um, Rasul. He was kicking the soccer ball in that video. He was one. Uh, he's one of the people that that I use a lot because he's bilingual, has connections to the elders, as does Mohammed over there, and Ifra. So, um, uh, Chief Utes um, had asked Marsal to get a hold of the elders. They finally agreed to meet. And as a result, the community came together and rallied uh, to show them support. And I think this was the first time where maybe they all, even though people were targeting them for to kill them, is that they felt a part of the community and, and welcome. So this is just a short video. My friend Mohammed, who he's probably been there, he's from Somalia, he's Muslim, has probably lived in Berlin longer than any of the others. Four o'clock, number one. I'm getting shot, I'm scared. Because I will not expect this can happen in Phoenix County, especially in Kansas City. And everybody is shot and scared. That's what happened in our community, Somalia community. And well, we, both of you are Somali. Yeah, we're all Somali. And Muslim. And Muslim. And we're also citizen. We're American. Okay. And uh, we come from the war in our country. Mm -hmm. They kill a lot of people, a lot of our relatives. We came uh, safely here in the United States. We work for Tyson. We make good money, good life, but we need a safe to be ourselves. Okay. That's why we're here, but we don't accept it. Uh, it can happen like this in God City. Because never. Sorry, that was, was difficult to hear. Uh, yeah, so, so as a result of some of the stuff that's going on, the Kansas Health Foundation began looking at uh, civic health, and they partnered with some other uh, eight uh, organizations. I'll let Larissa start here. So they examined civic health in Kansas with a specific focus on civic engagement in Kansas with the different levels of income, education, and racial and ethnic backgrounds. So they wanted to make sure everyone is included in the civic health and they wanted to make sure that all backgrounds were included. The key findings were that Kansas groups that are the least politically engaged are, experience the poorest health outcomes and struggle to access health care. So those in the lowest economic groups often have the lowest health outcomes and civically and with regular health. The socio-demographic factors highly related to civic engagement are education, income, race, and ethnicity. So the low level of political involvement for certain population groups suggests important perspectives are underrepresented in the democratic process in Kansas. So those who have factors that are lower in all education, income, race, and ethnicity are on the low level, that they are um, underrepresented in the political process um, in Kansas. You'll notice how that kind of relates to the demographics that, that we presented earlier and, and um, ethnicity and race, though it's a, a minority, majority, it's the, the government doesn't look like that. Uh, uh, while there are people from from other ethnicities, it's a majority white in the decision-making position. So the four constructs of civic engagement um, are civic action, civic commitment or duty, civic skills, and civic cohesion. So civic engagement is working to make a difference in the civic life of one's community. So then breaking down those four constructs, so civic action or participation in activities such as volunteering, service learning, to help, or service learning to help better the community. So I was a part of the service learning. So my aspect in this was service learning. And it's also including people to participate actively within their community. Civic commitment or duty, or the willingness to make a positive contributions to society. So people being willing to actively contribute in the communities of which they live. Civic skills, or the ability to be involved in civics, civil society, politics, and democracy. So 
the ability to be able to be involved in those conversations. So not only the willingness, but the information and the ability to actively be engaged and involved. And then social cohesion, or a sense of reciprocity, trust, and bonding to others. So as Kendall said, the elders don't trust a lot of people in Garden City. So if we can't make that bond better, then they're not going to be able to do the four, the three other steps of the constructs. So building that trusting relationship in the community so they will be willing to actively, civically engage. So some of the disparities uh, within the uh, within Kansas, uh, according to the U.S. Census Bureau, 61.3% uh, 60, of Kansas voted in the, can in the 2016 election, and 70% were registered. So that's a pretty good turnout. Um, but when considering race and ethnicity, voter disparity exists in turnout and registration. So white and Hispanic, 74% registered, 65% voted. Black, 61% registered in Kansas, but only 44.5% actually voted. Uh, Hispanic, 54% registered but only 48.9 percent turnout so even though overall we have a high percent of people registering our turnout rates are still pretty low so disparities in voter registration and voter turnout mirror health disparities in kansas so the disparities that we see in health in voter turnout and voter registration and that political side of things will mirror the health disparities we see in the state as well so lower levels of income and education are significantly poor health outcomes as well. So they mirror each other. At least, yeah, leaked poor health outcomes. But you'll notice, um, I don't necessarily count 74% as high participation rate, but the 54% is incredibly low, and 62% is, is pretty low um, as well. So, but there, there's things we'll talk about that kind of leaked to some of that, I believe, as well. So this kind of breaks it down um, in a chart form as well, breaks those numbers down. So uh, the top chart looks at it by income. So this first one is 44% uh, um, with an income of less than 35%. And this is local uh, elections in Kansas. And then the middle one, the, uh, the second bar is 35,000 uh, 35, to $49,000, and that's 63% of local voting and then um, fifty thousand to seventy four thousand dollars in income has a sixty six point three percent voter turnout and then seventy five thousand dollars or more has a sixty two percent voter turnout in local elections yes is this data self-reported or did it come directly from the elections this this was uh, data gathered by the Kansas Health Foundation and published so I'm not um, uh, I don't remember where they got all of their data from, but it was a, a study with, um, it's about three pages of people that contributed uh, to that and other organizations. And something, so Garden City's right in here for a mean average, of in, their mean income is right around the $50,000 mark. So then this bottom chart is another way to look at it, and this is based off of education. So this first one is less than a high school diploma, and then a high school diploma, some college, and then a bachelor's or higher. So it starts at 36.8% uh, voter turnout in local elections, uh, then 52% in local elections with a high school diploma, 64% with some college, and 70% with a bachelor's degree or higher. Well, you notice here. 70%, but that's of 16% of the population actually has that. So that's a, a small percentage of people. And less than high school is where you're going to run into a lot of people have uh, less than high school education and the immigrants and refugee populations uh, in particular. So uh, this is disparity self-reported in lo voting local elections. So this is Kansas in the blue bar versus the U.S. average. So this is looking at it based off of ethnicity. So our white versus uh, non-Hispanic in Kansas, uh, there's a 61.6% turnout uh, versus the U.S. average, which is a 59.6% turnout. And then black uh, non-Hispanic is a 46.3% turnout in Kansas, 
the national average is 61.5 percent, and then the Latino population in Kansas is a 26.8 percent voter turnout in local elections uh, versus the national average being 32 uh, percent in local elections. And just, just to clarify, is white not Hispanic? Versus white, not white versus Hispanic. Yeah, not right. Hispanic. Okay. All right. So, um, in my presentations in Garden City, I typically don't break break out this picture or this slide, but um, because it's a past president, uh, this went on a few years back, and this was a trailer park, a small trailer park right across from the community college, and um, um, let me say this up front. There was nothing illegally done. It was all legal. My issue is, there, is, is it moral and ethical what took place. So the, the college bought this land where these trailer houses set. They bought it from the individual who owned the trailer park. All the individuals owned their own trailers. Um, some things came together. The reason they were angry is because they weren't, nobody ever talked to them. The only conversation that really happened with them was, uh, sorry, uh, we bought the land, it's legal, and um, unfortunately your trailer house was built before 1978, so local law says you can't move it. So guess what, we're going to demolish your home that you own and bill you to haul it away. And that's what happened. And they were just left to their own, um, to get their own houses. So they, they were charged to leave their own house. Uh, that they own. Nothing nothing happened to support them, to get them into another home. They were just out. And um, I don't, I think everyone there, because I used to live right next door to these folks, um, were all English as a second language. Um, they're incredibly angry. This, the president is no longer there. Uh, I love Garden City Community College. I love the new president. Um, and again, nothing illegal happened, but these folks were just thrown uh, to the wolves, basically, just to their own, um, to take care of it. And it, people, I'll go back, people do feel helpless and hopeless. So absolutely nothing they can do about this. Now, what there is, now I, I don't have anything to actually 100% um, confirm this, but um, everyone in the trailer park uh, was adamant that one person was able to move their trailer house, even though it was built same time as theirs, because of who they worked for. And um, so, but that was, all, you know, they kept everything as quiet as they could, and they would just continue to say, um, sorry, there's nothing we can do about it, um, and that kind of thing. I, I, yeah, I would have hoped that the city would have uh, made an exception, at the, but absolutely did not. Nor did I know if anybody had enough money to actually pay somebody to move their trailer house to begin with. Uh, but it's devastating. So sometimes you need to start looking at things from a different perspective. And I think that's what the Kansas Health Foundation really helped with, is how can we give a voice and what's the most impact uh, for our dollars and that kind of thing. So, so what they came up with was what they called the Integrated Voter Engagement Grant. Um, it was about two and a half million dollars, if I remember correctly, and was available. They were going to give ten sites um, funding. Uh, uh, only two in western Kansas. Uh, one is in Liberal. The other one was the, this one that I wrote uh, for the Kearney County Hospital uh, when I was there. And it's a three-year, $250,000 grant. It's uh, getting ready to wrap up year two. Um, and what I named it was a pioneering, innovative, transfer, uh, transformative civic engagement strategy, so reducing political disparities to improve health outcomes. And health outcome as, as a broad definition, defining it broadly. So the real aims of the grant were improve voter registration, uh, which is kind of that get out the vote thing, but this is much more than that because that is real intense and then goes away. Real intense goes away. Uh, this is an ongoing piece. Uh, civic education, reducing barriers to registering uh, and voting, encouraging civic participation. Um, for instance, like being on a, coal a coalition member or board member, or actually running for office. Creating partnerships throughout the community, and statewide and nationally, and building organizational capacity. 
So this is kind of how it's thought of. So what often happens is get out the vote, this little piece down here. This was their um, vision. So holding elected, you know, elected officials accountable, defend and expand voter rights, engage and educate the electorate. Um, we spend a lot of time doing that. It is registering people to vote. It's helping them understand where to go vote, um, how to vote, that kind of thing. Organize and mobilize communities. Developing strong leaders. Uh, and I'll, I'll talk about how all this is what, what I'm working on currently. Achieve policy impact and then public persuasion. So, uh, like you said, one of the pieces of that is voter registration and getting people out to vote. So, uh, one piece we did with that was voter registration. So, we held a couple of voter registration days, and we provided, um, we not only helped people get registered to vote, but we provided a sample ballot for their county, so it looked exactly like the one that they would see when they went to vote. So, that way, if they had questions on what a word was, who someone was, that kind of thing. We could answer those questions or direct them um, to a pamphlet or a website or whatever to that but would have the information to help them make those informed decisions and show them what a ballot looked like and how that process worked. So while we were registering, we were also showing them what a ballot looked like. Um, overall, we registered around a little over 50 people and we were able to track um, voting participation of about 75 of those people. So this pie chart kind of breaks down um, our voting data that we collected. So early voting, we had about 43% of our uh, data was early voters. And then uh, we had 2% of provisional voters. Uh, we had 8% vote at a polling place. We had 13 that did not vote. And then we had 13% that did not vote. And then we had 32% that we weren't able to collect data on. Yeah. Oh, it's like they, they vote, but it's on conditions to where it gets, um, where they actually accept the ballot eventually. So I can give an example of that. I had one of these individuals call me and saying, hey, they're not going to let me vote. Then I talked with the uh, office and what, what happened, one thing that we kept running into, a lot of these folks were already registered to vote and had no idea that they were registered to vote. It was happening as they got their citizenship. Um, so... One individual still showed Dodge City as an address and had not moved, changed his address, had been over six months, that kind of thing. If it had been less than, I think, three, three or six months, I don't remember the rule, he actually could have still voted in Dodge. Uh, but they then let him vote provisionally. So here are some pictures of the day that we uh, went out and did register them to vote. It was a very cold, snowy day. And so they were very excited. They were happy to be there. Uh, they had all of their documentation, and they just kind of handed it to you and said, okay, make, you know, help me do this. And so uh, these three ladies kind of helped as our translators when we needed it uh, and helped us kind of put those pieces together where there was that language barrier, which was very helpful. Um, and we registered people kind of constantly all day. There was a constant flow. Uh, okay. The, this man here, he was also a huge piece of making this successful. So it was a cold day. And so he went in his van and drove around to some of the different communities or where <coughs> different people were living and picked them up and brought them to the learning center we were at so they could come and register to vote. So that was a very big piece in helping it be so successful. Even though it was cold, we were still able to get people there and help them register to vote. It was actually incredibly heavy snow, and and most uh, there's a lot of people without transportation. They could walk, and so he was going through the through the apartment complexes and and bringing people. There's a lot of people that came through that we identified that actually were registered, had no idea that they'd been registered. And the reason they didn't know they were registered is because when they go through the process of becoming citizens, they kind of just follow the lines. They're told, okay, go to this line, go to this line. And so they would be registered and have no idea because they were just doing as they were told. So, all right, so to a person, uh, they, and they continue to tell me, all right, so I'm so excited to finally get to participate in democracy. I can't wait. And so I'm thinking, okay, and then I get this. 
okay, I'm registered. I know, I now know where to vote. I sort of know how to vote. I don't know who the heck the people are that are running for office, or I don't understand the issues. So now what? Kind of McFly, most of you may don't remember the Marty, hello, hello McFly, you know, anybody home? It's like, of course, these are important things they have to understand. So and that's the educational piece then. I'm actually working with Jay Steinmetz um, to provide, and I, actually, I have a survey out right now in six different languages, asking people what they want to learn, need to learn, what nights, what days of the week, times, and, and for how long. So, so we'll be getting feedback versus creating some uh, curriculum and then going, gosh, this is so fantastic, I wonder why nobody comes. And, yeah. Sorry. Do you know, does the League of Women Voters, um, do they have multilingual voting guides, or is it? You know, I don't know that. In fact, um, during the uh, Mexican Independence Day celebration, uh, they were there registering people to vote. Just two ladies, and one lady had just started that chapter a year or two ago. And so I, d I had just met her. I didn't realize that it even had started. And, and she is one that I'm trying to partner with that can help continue with the registration, um, and, and which I also want to turn over and we'll be handing off with this grant to uh, make sure that, that this is sustained, uh, but handing it off to people within these populations that can do that. But that's a great question. I really don't know the answer to that. Uh, so one thing I did was, this was a gubernatorial debates. Um, I want to say this, the, the grant is, is non, uh, nonpartisan, and, and I was very clear and continue to be clear when I have to go to meetings and whatnot that in, in no way do I try to persuade anyone to vote anyway, uh, you know, for anyone or in any particular way. It's giving them information that they can digest and become informed voters. Because this, this is my friend Ephra. Uh, uh, Halima, sorry. Um, so Halima, you notice she uh, got a, uh, the DACA teachers, uh, supporting DACA and teachers uh, for this um, at Tyson where she works. And she was really excited. She wanted to meet Greg Orman and she wanted to meet Laura Kelly. So she got to do that. Um, she was very excited. She kept continued to say, I cannot believe that, that you can can have this opportunity to, to be this close to people that powerful in making these decisions for you, something they're not used to. And John Dole uh, was a running mate of Orman. He's a senator in, in the Garden City area, and they, they really like John. He does uh, try to support them in any way. I start to hear some grumblings now. It's like, okay, uh, talk is over. You know, we've had the talk. Let's see some action now. Um, but she was ecstatic, and plus getting to support the others. You'll, you'll know if you think back to who was running, you'll notice one, one person um, that, that she chose not to get a picture with. <laughs> um, so, so this is her uncle at, that um, owns the African shop, and uh, Adan is his name, and he's had that shop there for a few years. Actually, I ran into him, uh, I voted early last year, and I went in, and he happened to be voting. And, and early voting, there was only one machine. Everything else was done on paper, and he was voting on paper. Um, he was one that we registered. It was his first opportunity to vote. I go in, I vote, I'm done, I'm sliding it in the thing, and he goes, I need some help. I, I'm confused on this. And his English is a fair at best. And um, so what he had done, the very first thing was the, the, for the governor. And it says, pick two. Well, he was trying to pick Laura Kelly and John Dole, thinking I'm picking two different people, but this doesn't look right to me, and who are these other people listed with them? So um, and I had to sign an at, at the station as the, or affidavit, as did he, um, <clears throat> allowing me to, to help him. And so I requested... Well, they voided that ballot, but I requested 
for him to be able to use the machine because then he could always go back and make changes. Um, so, so he did. I got to explain to him on the on the for the governor's race, um, but he was, then he got to the judges. What does all this mean? Retain them and and that. So what I tried to explain that to him. What I did notice that he voted no unless the judge was from Garden City, had something to do with Garden City. They would vote to retain them. And I think it was because he didn't have an understanding, which is not unlike probably a heck of a lot of voters that, that should have the understanding, right? Um, and that's what I appreciated with all of them so much is I want to be informed. I want to be an informed voter. Um, so ultimately he got them. The other thing, there was a thing on for the uh, higher alcohol content, uh, um, beer being sold in like the Walmart and Dylan's net, which because he's Muslim, that was a no. I uh, wouldn't have cared at, at what amount. Uh, so I will say this is a gathering place. I, I, I've almost skipped over what I want to talk about here. So this was another issue that arose. So he'd been there for a number of years and um, you know, had gotten the license appropriately and all that. But suddenly the city says, there was a close to him, there's another uh, African shop called the uh, Somalian Wani Mall, just north of this one, about a half a block. <clears throat> and um, <clears throat> uh, next to door to him was a, a recreation or an exercise gym type thing that was put in. Somebody complained saying, hey, that's not zoned for that type of business. Well, then they say, nor is it zoned for this type of business. So they, what, I got a phone call from his niece, Halima, and say, hey, can you come up? We've got this paperwork from the city trying to make us move. So I go up and found out they'd been sitting on it for about three months. They'd had this letter for a long time. This was a Tuesday. They had till Thursday to answer it, or they were out of luck. The small Somalian Wani owner uh, had the same letter. Um, so in the meantime, uh, the first thing I did was wrote this letter, and um, as I was writing it, I was trying to look at where they had made exemptions with other businesses, and trying to find what might fit. Convenience store, any building or premises used for the sale of food and other items, as a quick service food, uh, a sundry store, which may include the dispensing of gasoline and oil, but which does not provide automotive maintenance or repair. Um, and it says may sell, it doesn't say have to. And as you can see, so, so the letter says, while well, this might not look like a typical convenience store, it's very much typical and is a convenience store for these populations. Um, I took Halima Road with me, we went to the city attorney, um, he, uh, I'll keep my thought. Um, um, they said, nice letter, I think I'm still going to win. And I'm thinking, this is a, how is this a, you know, I wasn't looking at it as a win-lose, it's like, isn't there some compromise? Well, in the meantime, the exercise place had rallied a lot of people, and they went before the committee, and the committee said, um, awesome, you can stay, we'll give you an exemption. These two still need to go. So um, we rallied a bunch of people and went, our, continuing to argue as a convenience store. So two members of the committee went up and said, you know what, this is a convenience store. So they're still there. Um, I've just been clear with them, do not do anything other than what you're doing now because somebody will be watching. Uh, obviously, um, we've, discovered some transportation issues. One, primarily, is that people don't have driver's licenses, and uh, <clears throat> nor do they know how to drive. But some that, do, uh, some that do have licenses, this is actually the apartment complex where the bomb threat was at. Um, so uh, we started, we, we got an agreement with um, the state of Kansas, the Department of Revenue, to provide free translation services to people that speak anything other than English or Spanish. And the reason not Spanish is because it's written in Spanish and English. So it's the only 
the only place in the state of Kansas that you can have translators as a result. There's a Garden City um, DMV. I, I, I've forgotten her name. Um, she's the very first person that took the test. This is Ifra Ahmed, a, who's a cousin to Halima, translating for her. There was television there. There was newspaper there. I don't know how she got any of them right. She missed one too many. Came back to, she's very embarrassed. Came back the next morning and passed. So she was her first one, um, and it just was unfortunate she didn't pass the very first time. What, what's interesting, oh, well, one thing that's going on now is that in the Burmese language, uh, there's a priest, and he will not translate unless they meet with him three times for some education. So they have this incredibly high pass rate. The other ones all have this incredibly high fail rate. And that's because there's not educational pieces set up. So currently, we're getting, with Ephra's help and some others, that educational piece translated into these other languages so that those education pieces can, can begin happening. But I would get a call occasionally from DNB. They're cheating. They're talking way too much to be translating that sentence. And their hands are moving. As you can see, I might talk like this. And um, so I said, well, there's a couple things probably at play. One, there's often not a word-for-word -word, uh, translation, and sometimes those words don't even exist, so they have to explain the word. And if they're cheating, don't you think they would at least help cheat good enough that they passed? And that, what does it matter if they're failing? It, but I, I said, I, I can't think that they're cheating if they're not passing. So then, the, guess what, the next phone call, Burmese are cheating, too many are passing. And that, that one came from the state, out to people. I said, here's why they're passing. So then we set up, what better way to, to express love and genuineness and warmth but to uh, invite people to have dinner with you, to eat with you. So what we did was set up, you can see we got really, um, you know, stole the title <laughs> of the show. But So these were a couple of Baylor students that came and interned. This is um, Mersal Halima, and um, we had these about 20 Southwest, typical Southwest Kansas farmer, white uh, families that invited, would have one or two families, and they invite them into their homes, and we provide transportation and an interpreter if, if someone didn't speak English. And you can see that's what's happening here. This is, I went to this home. Um, well, with some of my friends here. And uh, what they found out was like, God, we have a lot in common. You know, and it's like they're wanting the same thing we do, right? A safe place, a uh, place to raise our children, uh, to earn a living, to, to, to just kind of be left alone. The kids had a wonderful time playing together. And um, the next week after this, the um, Somalian community reciprocated. But theirs was a communal meal. So they invite everybody back to eat with them is in the back of the African shop and it was just kind of the buffet style uh, communal meal and uh, had an awesome turnout and they want to continue doing that. I'm going to keynote this um, Friday, but this multicultural summit has been going on for years in Garden City. This we actually were talking about that, uh, guess who's coming to dinner. and. Um, this is Ephraim Mersol, and this is Fatima, who um, I got to know because I got a phone call uh, one Sunday night that her husband uh, suddenly died in his sleep. Had gotten home from work at the, the majority of these folks work at Tyson, the beef packing plant. They do make good money, that, like Mohammed had said, that, you know, they start close to 17 bucks an hour. Um, but he came home, she was pregnant. Um, they had a, a son already, and um, he made her dinner because she wasn't eating well. Called his family, went to bed. They're all three asleep. She hears a noise, thinks it's a child that's sleeping with them. Turns on the light, watches him take his last breath. And they call, her brother calls me and says, we have no idea where to start. If we were in Minnesota, there's systems in place, there's a lot of support. We, we don't know where to go, what to do. Can you help? 
So uh, he speaks English, of course. Um, and so I, I would call him the night before and say, uh, please have Fatimo be ready at 8 a.m. I'll be at the apartment. We're going to go here, 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 and here. When I initially started meeting with her, there'd be just a, uh, the entire apartment would be full of people, like having to build this trust piece. Uh, because I kind of I get called, but I don't know the people when I go meet them. And um, so I spent a lot of time, three, four months with her, uh, getting her connected with insurance, uh, um, Medicaid, because the, they pay insurance by the week there. I didn't know that. I'm thinking, well, I've got 30 days. You know, insurance is paid. It stopped Monday. Uh, he died Sunday, stopped Monday. So I, we did an emergency thing on Medicaid. He had worked enough quarters that she got survivor benefits and a lot of things, but she had no idea. It got to where she was so comfortable with me that she began insisting that I stay in uh, the, the, for her office visits with the doctor prior to the pregnancy. Um, and so, well, that was, was very cool, that trusting piece that was uh, completely unexpected. We've also supported the Burmese population to start. So this is a Burmese New Year celebration. Uh, this is their second one. You'll see uh, this is Kai uh, Samo over here. Um, so they're Burmese. There, there's also, there, so there's uh, Burmese who are Buddhist. There's Burmese who are Christian. There's Burmese who are uh, Muslim. The Rohingya are the Muslim. They're the considered the most persecuted ethnicity in the world. Um, and what's interesting, like they fled into Bangladesh, um, by about three quarters of a million of them, because of the persecution. Here, here they cooperate because they, have, they rely on one another, and that stuff goes away. Now, there is still some tribalism in the Somalian populations, uh, but it's not, not to the extent you see so how, how do we help find a voice? Not only attending uh, gubernatorial um, uh, debates, but uh, Congressman Marshall agreed to do a town hall. I knew he was coming in to do a town hall on a Monday. So I got with his staff, and he agreed to come and do um, this with um, the refugees and immigrants in the back of the African shop. We had between 70 and 80 people from eight different countries. So it's been, it was being translated uh, concurrently in eight languages with these real loud fans because it was desperately hot. And they have these water coolers that aren't hooked up to water that just blow and big fans. They finally shut them off because people couldn't hear. Um, they asked him some incredibly tough questions. And they asked me beforehand, can we ask him this? So you can ask him anything. He's your representative. He works for you. And it's up to him to figure out how he wants to answer you. So first lady stands up. I've been here 14 years. I vote in every election. I'm a citizen. Um, my kids are here. Why is my husband still in a refugee camp and I can't get him to the United States? What's going on? What do you think he might have responded? Any guesses? Doctor. There's a process. Well, he said that the United States is so overwhelmed at the border that all the resources are taken, and that's why it's uh, unable to get some of these other things processed in a timely manner. So, I don't think I actually have time to show a video. Uh, maybe I've got a video of a good friend of mine, Amy, right here. Amy Longa is from Uganda. Rhymes, I know. Um, speaks five languages, and um, it works, works for the International Rescue Committee, which has did have an outreach office in Garden City, but one federal policy changed for refugees coming into the United States. They went from well over 100 a year, which was a, the minimum amount they could have to have funding, down to four. So that office closed. She now travels to Wichita to work. Uh, this individual, um, he was brand new to Garden City. I had just met him, got a phone call he, uh, uh, from his son, whom I still have not met, around uh, needing some, some assistance, uh, disability and some other things for a variety of reasons. So I called and asked if he'd like to go to this. He's in the southern part of Garden City. 
the majority of the uh, 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 Somalian and, and Muslim community is in the very north. So, and he, 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 um, because of some injuries, has an artificial leg and that kind of thing. No transportation. So I took him, and I, when we walked in the door, I said, hey, this is my uh, new friend, Abdullahi. And, of course, you know, he spoke the language. They, everybody started hugging him. He fit in, and you could just see his um, demeanor, everything, go like that. And, in fact, he didn't, I didn't take him home. They, they took him home. He now has transportation. He's working on citizenship and all that because now he has that connection to the community. There was an agency, the first day I met him, filled his pocket with bus tokens. They look like gold coins. He has no idea how to run, ride the bus system. And so I, so I got home to his son, uh, who has an attention span like me, like a knack, uh, the seventh grade son, who kept playing videos. And I kept saying, please, this is so important. Please make sure your father understands this. And the father finally got angry with him. But it's like, tell him those are not, they're not money. Those are not gold coins. They're for bus tokens, and I'll help him learn how to write that after we get through some of these other things. Uh, yeah. So I also think it's important to note that if you look in these pictures, everyone has their children there too, or a large majority of them do. So the children are also really excited to learn about this. Even when it came to um, in, uh, registering them to vote, the kids were there, they were asking questions, they were equally as excited. So they're getting their kids involved in the process and they're as excited to learn about it too. I'm going to skip this video for just a minute to go to here. This is kind of where, where I'm at right currently. Uh, so right after the Roger Marshall um, event, that town hall that evening, I had a, a young man come up to me um, who said, you know what we really need right now is a crosswalk between the two apartment complexes because the south one where the bomb plot was at, this is their mosque. It's an apartment that they rent. There's, they estimate there's about 800 or more uh, Muslim. So when they, when they all, there's about, there's two times that, and maybe a third time, I've not figured out exactly, when they all pray at once. So I use a, a tennis court two blocks north of me uh, because it's the only thing large enough to kind of hold them and, and have the bottom. So they, they called and said, so well, so I, I got a group of them and we went to the traffic advisory committee meeting which is part of like the grant getting people involved um, and, and typical government they voted to approve the crosswalk 5-0 voted 2-3 uh, against funding it so so you can have a crosswalk they're just not going to pay for it so in the meantime I'm talking with them and I say here's our dilemma is figuring out to raise money and they've been raising money within the, for a mosque for years, and they had about $67,000. Crosswalk's about seven or eight, but the mosque is their priority. So this was a meeting, uh, you can see Lana Duvall, who's the economic development director. I got a hold of Lana and I said, hey, this is their big thing right now they're wanting. And she goes, you know, I've been looking at some, um, thinking about this and some land, and a developer that I think might be willing to do this, so we've been meeting with them. Uh, the, these are their imams over here, their elders. There was always a minimum of three elders that have been coming. We're meeting every other Sunday. Um, they're saying, let's hold off on the crosswalk. The other is, we need child care, and there's all kinds of tenant, uh, landlord tenant issues. And the, the one person owns the majority of the apartments. So, they, so it's things such as, if, if an appliance goes out, you buy it, but it stays with the apartment. Oh, by the way, here's a $5,000 bill that you owe me when you move out on top of it uh, for damages. They're, they're scared to death to not pay those. I've reached out to the ACLU. ACLU does not do landlord-tenant stuff, but I have some friends there who've made some suggestions. But they're saying, well, if we had the mosque, could there be another building there that could be apartments and child care and this kind of thing. So there's a developer currently who's already in the process of paperwork for an apartment complex that has enough land that, that Lana believes 
he might be interested in building a building that would work as a mosque, work as a child care, and like a, uh, a meeting uh, for community, a communal meeting room. So ultimately they said, let's hold off on the crosswalk. They, uh, they were saying, we've got $67,000, I say, and uh, insisting that they own the, the mosque. And so it's explaining $67,000 is not going to build much of anything. So um, the next week I met with them, they, they had uh, 89000 shooting for 100 And Lana and I did some research. We found that uh, it's the Muslim American Society does matching grants with their um, um, priority is to build to assist in building one mosque in each state. So we're looking at uh, that, uh, they'll, they'll say sometime this quarter when it opens for, for the uh, uh, request for proposals will open in the spring. They're anxious, we need to do this right now. How long is it going to be? Can we apply today? And I keep saying time is good because we have to have a solid plan in place. And um, so right now we're just kind of waiting on the developer getting the apartment's approved, and then will he do this other stuff? The, the, the city manager is on board with this as well. So there's a lot of support with people that, that matter. Maybe you know that Tyson Fire has been disruptive. There's a lot of barriers to doing this work because of transportation and other things. The Tyson Fire, while it's still operational somewhat, they're working maybe up to four hours a, week, a day, but getting paid for 40 hours. If they, if they refuse to go in the part-time on a day, then they won't be. But uh, Helena, who I showed you, just had a baby a couple of months ago. Her husband's having to go, uh, uh, I think, to Columbus, Nebraska, to work at a packing plant. And he's gone all week, and, and, and he's not the only one. So they're being paid, they're getting to work, but it's been very disruptive to the families. So... Uh, I, I don't know. Yeah, three minutes, so I won't show you the video. It was actually Amy just asking him, saying, so you keep talking about the border, you keep talking about this, what we're hearing and what the message is out here is that you don't matter. Her husband doesn't matter. How can you have conversation about that and still say you matter? That kind of thing. And it's very articulate. You can go out and find, uh, if you do Roger Marshall, uh, Town Hall Refugees, you can find it, and there'll be a video, and Amy's in the red, and she challenges him twice. The first one's kind of hard to hear over the phone, uh, fans. Second time, you can hear uh, very well. So, um, any, any uh, thoughts, questions, anything? No, it's a lot to kind of take in. So we've got one more year with the intent of handing this off to the populations to to continue this work on their own, which I'll continue to support them in any way that I can. Uh, but I want them to, to have ownership of that, and they're really excited. And finally, like that 17-year-old that came up to me and said, we need a crosswalk. He's instrumental, and he's incredibly bright. And, and um, a friend of his who happened to be from Ethiopia and who came to the uh, Traffic Advisory Committee meeting um, is in college, you know, and it's like, continuing to build new leaders within their community that can help um, lead them uh, and their, their needs and have those out and, and being addressed somewhat. And that's the goal, is to get be, make them be self-sufficient and learn and that civic engagement piece, because if we can get them civically engaged and teach them how to address these issues like the crosswalk, then five, ten years down the road, if they have another issue, they'll be empowered to be able to bring that up in themselves. So I'll apologize again for getting emotional, but I, they're incredibly good friends of mine, and um, I just can't imagine being targeted that way. And, and I've got a four-and-a-half-year-old son, and he has friends there. You know, he loves going there. And uh, I just, I'm just putting myself in their place, and the trauma they've already, you know, continuing to be re-traumatized through other things is um, tough. Thank you. Thank you.